it's amazing to see God's ways, works, and wonders in people's life. Quite often, we look on the surface, and we do not see what happens in the deep. There's a difference between what is and what seems to be. Please imagine one of those public figures that in your humble opinion is the most unlikely to ever become a servant of God. Do you have that mental picture? Of the public figure that you would say, ah, this person, I don't think so. Now, fast forward, and a few years down the road, that person gives you a letter in which he or she gives his or her testimony, the story of his or her conversion. You read the story, and you are amazed, and you say, wow, that's unbelievable. What is and what seems to be. I have a good friend that is a PARL director, that's Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, in one of the highest structures of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this guy has a special gift to get in touch and uh, approach public personalities. You know, sometimes we assume those are difficult people to approach. And this guy has, I believe, a God-given gift to go to them, to speak to them, to convince them. And uh, in one of my conversations with this friend, he gave me a few snippets from the life of a very famous public figure in one of the countries he was, at the time, the foreign affairs minister. The minister for foreign affairs. That's a high-ranking statesman in the government. And he told me, you know, when there was that political election-related scandal, and this guy had to step down. That morning, this guy called me. He called the Seventh-day Adventist pastor and asked for prayer. Asked for prayer so that when he goes out, because he had to present his resignation publicly, when he goes out, he will do the right thing and he will say the right thing. Ever since I started following the trajectory of this politician, and I found out that sometime later, after that event, he even got baptized. Well, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. But since he got baptized, my best assumption is that he has the desire in his heart to follow Jesus Christ, the Savior. I have watched his political speeches. Now he's a senator in that specific country. And I'm amazed to see how boldly he speaks up for the right and uh, how boldly he speaks up against the wrong. I also watched a sermonette he delivered last year at a baptism. He gave a sermonette and toward the end of his sermonette, he also gave his personal testimony. And I was impressed when he said, you know, my wife and my daughter got baptized a few years prior to my baptism. I wasn't ready at that time. But then he ended in this note. He said, you know, in those difficult trials, you raise your eyes to God and 
the good Lord answers. All these are coming from a public personality, from a politician, somebody that you may think, well, those folks are corrupt people. And it would be probably hard to challenge that view. And yet, what we know is there is a difference between what is and what seems to be. Daniel chapter 4 is the testimony of a public personality, one of the most famous public personalities of ancient history, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, I call him King Nabucco. He gives in chapter 4 in the book of Daniel his testimony, the story of his conversion. Actually, the letter he wrote was intended to be sent out in all his kingdom so that everybody can read it. And this is how he sets the foundations of his testimony in chapter 4, verse 2. He says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Doesn't that sound like a good Bible verse for a Thanksgiving sermon? Huh? I thought it, that's a politician. That's a public figure, a high-ranking person, a king, a pagan king, king of Babylon. He says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. Yes, the most high God works for Nabucco as well. Let us pray. Lord, we are here to get understanding, teaching from you. And we pray to, to the Holy Spirit to teach us and give us the right perspective on your ways, works, and wonders in ours and other people's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 4 has a very interesting structure. Because it looks like a sandwich. A sandwich, can you imagine a sandwich with two slices of praise? Praise on one side, praise on the other side. Two slices of praise. And in between those two slices of praise, you have a thick, a fat patty of a dream. Yes, because you can see there the king's praise on one side and on the other. That's a chiastic kind of structure. And then you have the content of a dream, the interpretation of a dream, and the fulfillment of a dream. That dream happens in the second phase of King Nabucco's life. The history of King Nabucco can be divided in two major parts. First is Nabucco the destroyer. He's the cruel thing, uh, uh, king. He's the heartless emperor. But then there's a second phase. Nabucco the builder. The dream happens in the second phase of his life. And uh, in verses 4 and 5 here in chapter 4, we can read some context how this whole thing started to happen. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. He had his high life, just like the kings, right? Well, I saw, he says, a dream which made me afraid. Even kings get afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the vision of of my head troubled me, says King Nabucco. So after he sees the dream, he again 
shares the dream with his experts, the wise men. This time he remembers the dream, all the details of it. But guess what? Again, the experts fail to tell him the significance, the meaning of the dream. And again, somebody else steps in. Who do you think it is? Daniel. He has a special gift from God. So what is the dream? I'm going to go quickly through the dream because my point this morning is to focus on the two slices of praise because it's thanksgiving, right? So let's go to the dream. Chapter 4, verse 10. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. It leaves, its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Interesting dream. But then somebody, a heavenly messenger, a watcher, comes down with a message and this is what the watcher says, coming from heaven. Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the bees get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let, his graze with the bee, let him graze with the bees on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Also, oh, this is a human being. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times or years pass over him. Verse 17. This decision is by the decree of the watchers. So this is not just an ordinary decision of somebody. It's not even the decision of God alone. It is a decision... A decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of man. Gives it to whomever he wills and sets over it the lowest of men. This picture is remarkable. We will see it later in the book of Daniel and some other parts of the Bible as well. Because it seems that God has a heavenly council in which some decisions are made with regard to the living, to those on earth. And the decision of the watcher here, the decree of the watcher is not made by one person. It's the watchers. It is the holy ones. So when the king uh, tells the story of the watcher, then the story goes on and he expects that Daniel will be able to explain the dream. And the next verse explains that the king has expectations from Daniel for one reason. He says, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Please notice this. There is a public personality. There is a king, a despot, a tyrant that sees that in somebody, in a servant of God, the Holy Spirit is present. For the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. And then Daniel starts explaining the dream. He is deeply troubled because he understands the dream is about the king. Verse 22 says, is, It is you, O king, 
who have grown and become, became, become strong. This is the tree. The tree is the king. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And then Daniel goes on, starting with verse 25, explaining the message of the watcher, the heavenly messenger. They shall drive you from man. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make you eat grass like oxen. Huh. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times, that is seven years, shall pass over you till you know two things. What are the two things? Till you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of man. The most high rules in the kingdom of man. And second thing, he gives it to whomever he chooses. And it goes on. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. After you come to know that heaven rules, after you know that heaven rules, the kingdom will be given back to you. Therefore, O king, watch how nicely, how tenderly Daniel makes an appeal to the king. King, think about this. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous. You would say, well, a public personality like this king really has some sins to break off, right? Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Yes, a public personality should show mercy to the poor. Perhaps, says Daniel, perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. What do you think? Will King Nabucco listen to the appeal for repentance that Daniel brings to him? No. The story goes on saying that after 12 months, the king was walking on top of his palace, looking around, and he has a very short speech, a very short discourse there, verse 30. This is what he says. And watch how much this discourse is emblematic of our earthly human pride. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my might and power and for the honor of my majesty? His pride, his loftiness, his self-centeredness. And while he is still speaking, while the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. Verse 32. And they shall drive you from man, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times, seven years shall pass over you until you know, again, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of man and gives it to whomever he chooses. Very interesting story, isn't it? And then, it is fulfilled exactly the same way. The king gets some sort of a mental illness. Some say it's an illness called lycanthropy. Lycanthropy from leukos in Greek, which means wolf, and anthropos, which means human. It is a mental sickness in which somebody believes to be a wolf and behaves like a wolf. Very rare disease. But it exists. After the seven years pass, because that's the prophecy. The prophecy to the king says, seven years will pass over you. And then you will raise your eyes up to 
the Almighty, the Most High, and then you will change your attitude. And that's exactly what happened, says verse 34. And at the end of the time of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and, pra and praised and honored Him who lives forever. I would need this Bible verse to stay on screen here because there is something very difficult to grasp here. We are dealing with prophecy. And many people have a hard time understanding prophecy because it entails a very challenging question. The question is this. When it's, it's about a prophecy, and specifically when it's about a prophecy that deals with somebody's personal life, is prophecy predestination, divine predestination, predetermination, or rather divine foreknowledge? Did you get the question? When God tells somebody, hey, seven years will pass. This is what will happen to you. And then after the seven years, this is what is going to happen to you. What is that? Is that divine predestination, predetermination, or divine foreknowledge? Pretty challenging. If it is divine predestination, it means that God at one point, right after the moment when the king was on top of his palace and had that famous discourse, about who he was, how strong, how great he was. God switched his reason off. Right? He just turned the switch. And then seven years later, God switched his reason on. But by this time, it was a totally different human being. Something had happened in between. And now this human being whose reason was switched on, turned on, looks up, recognizes God, and starts giving thanks to God. What do you think? Is that what happened? Well, not really. Why not? Because please notice the order of realities in this very Bible verse. The Bible text doesn't say that God took away the willpower of King Nabucco. The, the passage doesn't say that God switched off, turned off his power to decide, to make a decision. No. He had the possibility to make a decision. How do I know? This is what it says. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, Lifted my eyes to heaven. So he had the possibility to lift his eye to heaven or not lift his eye to heaven. Because only after he lifted his eye to heaven, that's when his understanding returned. Do you follow the order? So first he, lift, he decided to lift his eyes up to heaven. To see, to recognize that heaven rules. To see that God has the power to rule the mankind and also give it to whomever he wants. And only then his understanding, his full persona, his reason, his complete humanness comes back to him. And then when his reason comes back, only then he starts praising God. Only then he praises and blesses and honors God. So this is not an automatic reality, as if somebody was switched off here, and then God rearranged something in his mind, in his brain, and was switched on here, and like a robot, that guy now started praising, honoring, blessing the Most High. No, no, no. So we are not dealing here with predestination. We are dealing with pre-knowledge or foreknowledge on God's behalf. What is that? Well, 
let me illustrate this for you. Can you see that basket right there? Can you? Anybody can see the basket? Anybody cannot see the basket? Okay. Well, Can you see the basket now? Could I have seen the basket before I put it there? In my imagination? Of course, yes. And you will say you could have seen it because you knew you wanted to bring that basket out. So you had a mental picture of it. Are you following me? Okay. So you're accusing me that the only reason why I could see the basket is because I knew I was going to bring it out. And many people believe that's how God's foreknowledge works. Uh -uh. That is included in His foreknowledge. But His foreknowledge is much wider than that. Because God knows even if somebody else will bring out the basket. Did you get it? Even if somebody else brings out a basket for I don't know where, from uh, I don't know where, even that God knows because He has a vision of everything. Everything that exists and everything that does not exist yet. So in this case, you can see the difference between predestination and foreknowledge. What is the difference? Let me illustrate it in a different way. Suppose the game between the Rams and the 49ers has happened already. I'm hearing there is a game coming up. Is there a game coming up? Or it happened already? Okay. Tell me, so the game happened, okay? I have not had the chance to watch it, but you have watched it. You tell me the score, the final result. Who won, the Rams or the 49ers? Come on. <laughs> All right, whoever won. If you won the 49ers, fine. If you won the Rams, fine. But this is the point. I didn't watch the match, the game, okay? So I'm going home, and I take my laptop, and I watch the game. Now, when I watch the game, I already foreknow the result, right? Because you told me the result. The fact that I already know the result when I watch the game, does that influence the decisions of the players when they play their game? Does it? No. See, well, this is just an illustration. But I'm trying to convey the idea that God's foreknowledge does not necessarily take out somebody's decision-making somebody's willpower, the right for you to decide whatever you want. In Nabucco's situation, at a theoretical level, he could have chosen not to lift up his eyes to heaven and not to recognize God. The only thing is that God told him, because God knew in advance, he told the king, what would happen. And from this perspective, watch this, prophecy is an act of divine love. Because had not God given him the time frame, seven years, King Nabucco, when the sickness, the mental illness hit him, he could have come to the conclusion, boy, I'm gone. This is for the rest of my life. But that's not what happened. 
God gave him a token of his love. The king, Nabucco, the pagan king, got a, a dream from God telling him, hey, 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 you're in my hands. I have to bring you down. But don't worry. Don't despair. You are in my hands. And now I would like us to turn to the two slices of praise. Remember the sandwich? Praise at the beginning and praise at the end. Verse 3 first. That's the praise him at the beginning of his testimony. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Look how kingdom and dominion appear here. And then the other slice will reflect back on it, will mirror it back. Verse 34, the second part, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And verse 35 says, and this is profound, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. These are the conclusion, the conclusions of a guy that used to walk on his palace Look around and say, hey, guys, who's King Nabucco? And he says, no, no, no. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He, that is God, does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth. If somebody thought God is only there doing some stuff up there, uh-uh, no. Up there too but down here as well. And then he concludes, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? When your child is about to do something that you deem to be bad, what would your reaction instinct be? Right? Hold his or her hand back. When your spouse does something or is about to do something that you think is something, something wrong, what would you do? Bring that hand back. Stop it. Right? When you see your coworker doing something that is shady, you want to catch that hand and, and pull it back. Right? When you see your boss doing something wrong, maybe touching somebody the wrong way, what would you do with that hand? Block it. Refrain it. Bring it to no motion. What if the politicians want to do something? I know, I know it's all out there in the air, especially now that a new mutation of the virus some say is in the air already. And there will be some reaction to it. And what would you, would you do with the politicians that have to make a decision? Right? Don't do that. And King Nabucco says, you can't do that to God. So then who's in control? <laughs> you can't do that to God. And that question, I mean, uh, that, that cut my intestines. You cannot say to him, what have you done? You, you just cannot. Some of you know that my family is going through some turmoil, some hard times right now. I have a cousin that lives in Germany. She is one year older than me. Her husband, 43 year old, he's in the hospital, has been in the hospital for more than two weeks now in coma, intubated because of COVID. And we are praying for him. We keep on praying. I called 
his wife this morning, my cousin, I, I prayed with her. Very, very hard experience. This COVID thing has, has been in their family for a month now. And we still don't know what is going to happen. Of course, we pray for the best outcome, right? What if the worst will happen? Can we tell God, say to God, what have you done? Life. And when you recognize these realities, your entire being starts functioning in a different dimension. Right? And look at the conclusion of King Nabucco, verse 36. At the same time, my reason turned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles restored to me, resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. A better translation would say he's able to bring down. Some translations say he's able to humble. But I will come back to this concept of humbleness. But watch this. What happened to King Nabucco? What was and what seemed to be? How did King Nabucco reach this level of acknowledgement and recognition of God's most highness? How did it happen? Did it happen like this? Go and look at chapter 1 and see how King Nabucco is impressed by the excellence of some servants of the Most High. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. How he finds them ten times better, wiser, more capable than anybody else in his realm. One important thing that you can see. One important thing that you can notice. Then, look in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 47. It's right after the dream with the great statue, when Daniel comes to the king and tells him, King, you know why you got this vision? Because God wants you to know. Daniel tells the king, the king, God cares about the king. And what's the reaction of the king? Look, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings. He doesn't say the Lord of lords. Because he was the Lord of lords in his view. But still he recognizes some aspects in how God works in the deep. What is and what seems to be. Then go to chapter 3. In chapter 3, you have the three young men in the fiery furnace. And when they come out of the fiery furnace, after Jesus Christ himself, Michael, the pre-incarnate Christ, the Messiah, shows up. Right there in the middle of the fire, what does the king do? He almost delivers instantly a thanksgiving sermon. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because there is no other God who can deliver like this. And yet, at this point, this God, this unique, this excellent God is still not his God. 
he would still not accept him to be his God. But then you move to chapter 4. And this is when it comes to the surface that God has become the king's God. Conversion happened. And conversion happens in his case, not that it happens the same way in every single case. There are different people, different scenarios. But in his case, according to verse 37, here in chapter 4, verse 37 says that God can bring somebody down. And I said, some translations say, God can humble somebody. Let me ask you something. What is the correct biblical view of humbleness? Is God the one that humbles you? Or is it you that humbles yourself? God, you. God, you. What is the biblical teaching? In 2005, I had the privilege to go on a mission trip to Africa for the very first time in life in my life. And it was a shock because imagine from uh, the winter of Romania, uh, below freezing point, that was in February, below freezing point, you just ended up in the summer, hot summer of Central Africa. Brother, what a thermal shock it was. But even more, even more shocking was to see the scarcity, the starvation, and the sickness going on in those places. When I came back, back home, I was still a student. I was in my final year of college. I was standing in line at the cafeteria waiting to get some food. And next to me, right next to me, one of my professors showed up. And he looked at me and said, hey, how are you? Welcome back. Then he asked me a question, looked at me and said, listen, I have a question. Has it humbled you? I was like, what? Humble me? Hmm. I think I was too young at that time to even understand the question. 23 or so. I think my kites were flying so high at that time. Humble me for what? But then with time I started understanding that actually the right question was not whether those circumstances, those experiences have humbled me. The right question would have been, have you humbled yourself seeing all those things? Have you recognized God in your life somehow? Have you come to the understanding that, hey, it's not only you on this earth? Have you, have you become a grateful human being for all the blessings that God pours upon you every single day? Have you humbled yourself? And the reason I say that would have been the right question is because I looked at 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Can you see the interaction here? Yes, God has the capability of bringing you down. His mighty hand can bring you down. And sometimes in life, we need a mighty hand to bring us down. I want to ask you, have you ever felt a mighty hand bringing you down? It usually happens when you are up there and you are the king of the world. You are on top of the world. And out of a sudden you feel like a mighty hand grabs you and starts bringing you down. Now, sometimes... There are people, or the devil himself, that bring you down to humiliate you. There's a difference between humiliation and humbleness. 
when the devil or any agent of the devil tries to bring you down, that's humiliation. And it's done with the purpose that you will never ever come back up. You will stay down there. That's not what I'm talking about. That happens, and when that happens, the good Lord comes down to you, grabs you, and lifts you up. But there are moments in life, and that's what I'm pointing out here. There are moments in life when you know it wasn't the devil. You know it wasn't an agent of the devil. It wasn't any kind of evil spirit. It was the hand of the Most High that grabbed you and uh, from up high brought you low. And you started waking up. Because when you're up there, you don't look up. You just look down on everybody. When the mighty hand brings you down, You have a chance to look up and recognize that heaven rules. Thanksgiving. The most difficult time to give thanks to God is right at the moment when the mighty hand brought you down. And there's a false theology sometimes among us when we say, just thank the Lord, just praise the Lord, no matter what. Uh -uh. The Bible doesn't teach that. The, the, the Bible doesn't, doesn't push your brain or wash your brain so that you praise the Lord. No, no. If you are right in that moment when, when the mighty hand brought you down and you know Something is wrong happening and, and you cannot praise the Lord yet. Because don't believe that King Nabucco started praising the Lord right away when, when the Lord brought him down. But somehow, somewhere throughout the seven years while he was grazing. How does that sound? Right? Somehow, because don't assume animals cannot talk to God or God cannot talk to animals. And he wasn't an animal. He became somewhat like an animal. But somehow in that process, the Lord started working with him because he allowed the Lord to work with him. And, and when the time was up, he decided to lift his eyes up and recognize that heaven rules. That the Most High rules even among the living. And he can give dominion and kingdom to whomever he wants to give it. This is the experience I've been through. And some of you have been through. Some of you may be going through right now. And some of you will probably go through in the future. Don't forget. It is your decision whether you lift your eyes to heaven or not. But there's nothing more beautiful then leaving stage the way Nabucco left the stage. I very much like the way Ellen G. White concludes the conversion experience of Nabucco. This is what she says in Prophets and Kings 521. The once proud monarch had become a humble child of God. Did God humble him? Well, the Bible says God brought him down. But it was his decision to humble himself. And did God bring him back up? Of course. It's not his pleasure to see you down there in a, an animal-like state. 
no matter how good that state may be for an animal, his desire is to place you to the right place so you can fulfill your role in society, in history, and in the story of eternity. So brothers and sisters, what is and what seems to be. Be by His grace what He wants you to be. Amen.